Thanks everybody for being here with us today. I'm going to start doing my intro as folks trickle in. Um, but welcome to our LCCMR lunchtime lecture on invasive species. Thanks everybody. And I'm so glad to have you here. My name is Rory Anderson. I'm a project analyst and communication specialist for the LCCMR. As we begin, I just want to see, I want to recognize we've got um, some LCCMR members in the audience. We have citizen member Nancy Gibson, and I don't see any other LCCMR members at this time, but um, did I miss any other elected or appointed officials? Um, Representative Morrison. Oh, Representative Morrison just joined us, our newest LCCMR member. So thanks for being here. Um, so today we're going to be learning about three different completed invasive species projects, all of which were funded by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. After each presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A with the presenter. If you think of any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen at any time, and you can join the queue for questions. Or you can always drop a question in the chat, um, and an LCCMR staff member will uh, be able to read it off later. Uh, our first presenter today is Brian Nurbun, Regional Fishery Fisheries Manager for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. We'll be learning about his project, which is called Invasive Big Head Carp and Silver Carp and Native Fish Evaluation Phase 2, which was funded in Minnesota Laws 2017. Welcome, Brian. I think you're muted, Brian. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Sorry about that. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, with LCCMR funding uh, to work on both learning about and removing invasive carp from uh, some of our rivers here in Minnesota. I'd like to start off my presentation by acknowledging some of our other funders in addition to the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, we've been getting uh, financial assistance from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from the Lassard Sands Outdoor Heritage Fund, and also from the United States Geological Survey. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge as I get started, Ben Larson, who's our invasive carp specialist. You'll see his face a lot um, in this presentation. Um, so Ben is this guy right, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, is this guy right here in the, in the boat. And uh, so you'll see him a lot. He's done a lot of really great work to make this project happen. So I definitely want to call out and say what a great job Ben's been doing. So um, what, is our, what is our program about? Um, so we are trying to use both traditional and novel fishery sampling gear to detect, respond to uh, reports of invasive carp and to monitor invasive carp in Minnesota waters. Uh, so we're also trying at the same time while we're looking at invasive carp, we're also trying to collect data on some of our native river fishes so we learn how they are interacting with in invasive carp, the habitats they're using, um, the times of year that they're, they're interacting. And so that'll play into potentially how those species will interact in the future too. Um, one of the things that we do a lot of as a part of this is we work with commercial fishers who are working on the Mississippi River. Uh, so some of that has been hiring commercial fishers like you see in our picture here to do some of our netting because they have these really big boats and a lot of gear and a lot of knowledge about how to catch fish out on the river. Um, and we've also been able to build through that uh, work some relationships so that when they're out doing their own work to catch fish that they're harvesting to sell on the market, um, we can also have them be some of our additional eyes and ears out there looking for invasive carp so that we can hear about those captures as well. Hey, Brian, I think we're seeing your presenter view with all of your notes. Oh, sorry about that. I'm not, <laughs> no sure, why that's, not sure why that's the case, but I will switch it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. All right, I'm just gonna share, share it again. <clears throat> 
All right, hopefully that looks a little better. Uh, so one of the main things we've been doing to learn about invasive carp on these rivers is we've been doing a lot of monitoring of some fish that we've been able to tag on the river. So some of those have been invasive, been invasive carp, like the big head carp you see in the lower right of the screen. And uh, that's, uh, that's been allowing us to then watch the movement of that fish and see which habitats it's using and what times of the year. And we've done the same with a bunch of native species. Uh, so we're able to track their movements as well. And we do that through a, a network of 61 full-time receivers on pools two through five of the Mississippi, so the St. Croix and the Vermilion Rivers. Um, plus some seasonal deployments that we do of different receivers for, for different targeted sorts of efforts. Um, and in addition to the work that we're doing on those pools, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has identical gear that they're using on pools 5A through pool 20. So we get coverage, basically the, the entire length of the upper river of the Mississippi from St. Louis upstream, um, so that tagged fish can be tracked throughout that entire reach um, of their movements. Um, so we're able to detect tagged fish that might move up um, that other people have tagged, like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in those lower pools. And they can also monitor for our fish that we might tag that might end up moving downstream into those other pools as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been learning from some of the, those tagged fish. So this graphic on the right shows a map of the St. Croix River and its confluence in, with the Mississippi down at Prescott. And the red circle you see bouncing around is the tagged big head carp that we have in the St. Croix River. And that circle shows the fish's movements through a, a 2018 to 2019 seasons. Um, and so a couple of take homes that we've been able to learn from this is for one thing, it doesn't stay in one place as you can see. Uh, this fish tends to move around a lot and it moves around seasonally. And as we watched it over different years, we watched that it actually has patterns that we can expect it to do some of the same things in, in different years. Uh, so one example of that is uh, that uh, you'll see that it spends a lot of time up by Bayport. Um, and there's a bay called Anderson Bay there that tends to warm up a little bit faster in the springtime. And that fish will spend some time in that bay just about every year at that time of the year. And so that's allowed us to learn that that's a habitat that these invasive carp tend to like. And so they're using that habitat as a place uh, that we can then at a certain time of year, know there's a pretty good chance there might be fish there if they're in the area, and we can target some of our removal efforts there that way. So as a result, we've gone out and done uh, what we call trader fish uh, targeted uh, removal efforts. So we follow that fish, that tag fish into that bay when it's there, we know that's a good time. And so we'll go out there with our removal gear and do some netting. And so these are just three of the, of the six uh, invasive carp that we've been able to remove from the St. Croix River um, or the Mississippi by following that fish around and uh, knowing these habitats when we can target. Um, next, I'm gonna shift into an, a, a different part of the river. This is way down by La Crosse. And uh, this is an area of Pool 8. Um, so not too far from the Iowa border. And uh, in this area, there was a, a commercial fisher. Like I said, we've got these relationships where we know them, they know us, and they know what we're looking for. And so this commercial fisher was doing some netting to harvest fish to be able to sell. And they called us up and said, hey, we think we've got some invasive carp in our net. So you guys want to come down and check it out. And so we sent our folks down there and also let the Wisconsin DNR and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service know this was happening. And we were able to meet up with a commercial fisher and um, sort out all of those silver carp that you see in that lower right photo. Um, so this, this event resulted in, in a, over 50 invasive carp being removed from the Mississippi River. Um, and it was that relationship with those commercial fishers that allowed us to, to be a part of getting that to happen. And then we also were able to collect data on those fish. Um, so not only their size and their sex and their species, but also um, we can actually remove some of their um, bone structures. And there's techniques can be used to actually look at where those fish um, spent most of their lives um, and potentially where they were born. So we can see if they're local fish versus fish that have moved into the area. Um, so this big capture event down in this part of the pool was, was pretty surprising. Um, this was in 20, uh, 2020 in the spring. And uh, this was probably in res as a result of, of um, some higher water that had been happening on the river. And so some fish were able to move into the area. And so we decided we wanted to look into maybe doing some more additional removal efforts to try to see if we could get more fish out of this, this part of the river. Um, so we started looking at doing what's called a modified unified method. 
Um, and this is a method that the US Geological Survey um, has been adapting from a Chinese technique that they use to harvest invasive, harvest these species in China where they're native um, during, as part of their aquaculture of, of raising these fish. Um, and it basically means that you've got a large area um, that these fish might be in, but these fish, because of their behavior, we've been able to learn um, that they're they're very skittish, and that you know is seen in the fish jumping out of the water that people maybe seen videos and stuff of. Um, and so they actually swim in schools, and they respond to different noises and other stimuli, and will leave areas because they don't feel it's safe. And so we can actually use boats, and so you can see in the background there's some other boats out there on the water. And those boats were, were having both, um, some of them were electric fishing boats that put a current in the water that would drive fish in certain directions. And then also there were boats with speakers that uh, broadcast certain frequencies of sound that these fish really don't like. And so we're able to move fish out of certain areas and, and concentrate them in a, an area that we can then drag a big net that's called a seine through and pull those fish into a small defined area and sort through them and look for invasive carp and, and also collect some data on the native fishes that are there at the same time. Um, so this has been done in other states like Kentucky, Illinois, and Missouri. Um, and for example, in Kentucky, in a, in a lake where they've got a really heavy invest, infestation of invasive carp, they were able to remove 240,000 pounds of invasive carp using this technique. Um, we don't have anything like that for numbers of fish in Minnesota right now. Um, so they're testing out, the USGS was really interested in testing out these sort of techniques in a really low density setting to see if we could still find invasive carp and remove them here too. So here's kind of what we ended up doing. We had that, that big capture event down here where we got 51 invasive carp um, with that commercial fisher. Um, so then we started working with the USGS, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Wisconsin DNR, um, and uh, planning our own removal effort. Um, part of that was we went out and did some initial commercial fishing um, where we hired a commercial fisher to do some reconnaissance. We were able to catch five silver carp in the same sort of general area, and we were able to tag them thinking that we would be able to follow those fish and maybe have some similar success to what we'd had in the St. Croix. Uh, so in 2021 in April, uh, we came back and did that modified unified uh, effort over about a week's time where we targeted multiple sites and did some removal efforts. And here's what we ended up capturing. Um, so we ended up removing multiple invasive carp. Um, it was about 30 fish that we were able to pull out um, in, that, in, that, in, in that modified unified method that we did. Uh, so it was a, a quite successful effort and we were, we were really pleased and so was USGS that even in these more low density environments, we can use these techniques to remove fish. Uh, next up, finally going to shift gears and talk about um, some work that we've been doing down in southwest Minnesota. Um, so you can see in the, that little map inside of the Minnesota, this is way down on the Iowa border. Um, and uh, this is just north of the Iowa Great Lakes, so Lake Okokoboji is down there. Um, so in 2011, um, the, the first invasive carp showed up in Lake Okoboji after a big flood. And uh, that uh, spurred Minnesota DNR to think about, start thinking about that this is a potential backdoor way that invasive carp might be getting into Minnesota watersheds. And so we started looking at places where we could put barriers that would prevent invasive carp, carp from both getting into some of our lake resources down in that part of the state and from crossing over the watershed boundary into the Minnesota River uh, watershed and creating an invasion, invasion pathway that way. So all of the numbered locations you see on this uh, map are where we built barriers. And that was done with Lassard Sands Outdoor Heritage Funds. Um, some of those are physical barriers. Some of them are electrical barriers. Um, but they're all intended to stop invasive carp from moving upstream from downstream places. And then there's two locations that Illinois outlet and and that Bella outlet, those are both starred. Um, those are locations where we ended up um, getting reports that people were seeing what they thought were invasive carp. And so our invasive carp crew went down and did some removal efforts there as well. And so here's what we ended up uh, capturing down there. Again, we got a mix of, of silver and big head carp. Um, and uh, so we were able to remove a, a few dozen uh, plus fish um, that we're trying to move up into Minnesota waters. So it was, it was good to confirm that those barriers were functioning because these were all stacked up below those barriers. Um, so it was, a, it was a good confirmation that that, that work was important and, and was, was doing its intended job. Uh, so here's just kind of a, a summary of what we've been doing for captures over the, the life of these different appropriations from Lassard Sands. So this particular one I'm talking about started in 2017. 
Um, but our first Lessard Sands appropriation where we started learning about and using some of these techniques was back in 2012. Um, and so you can see that we've been ramping up um, the number of captures over time, um, but that's especially been high over 2020 and 2021. Um, and part of that is, in, is, in, is due to us getting better and learning more about how to target and capture these fish, but also part of it, like I mentioned earlier, is about high water and, and the movement of these fish. And so this is 2019 on the Mississippi River at Davenport, Iowa, and that's a lock and dam that's out there in the main river. So normally the river would be flowing just through that lock and dam. Um, and those locks and dams can function as a barrier during low water times where the fish is unable to move upstream very well. But during 2019, the fish could not only swim through the lock and dam, they could swim right around them in a lot of places. And so we saw a lot of movement of invasive carp upstream. And that's what's took, sort of driven some of our higher numbers lately. And so what we're trying to learn about now is what are those fish that moved up here going to do? Um, what habitats are they going to use? And um, are they gonna stick around? So those five invasive carp that we tagged previously that I mentioned um, at, as part of that pool eight effort, those all ended up moving downstream where we haven't seen those in, in Minnesota waters anymore. Um, and so some of those fish obviously went back. They decided that maybe their habitat was better downstream. Um, so we're gonna see it, how many of those fish stick around and whether our removal efforts can thin them down and keep them to numbers where we don't see a population start to establish reproduction up in Minnesota waters. So um, there's our contact information. This has been something we've also been doing, having an invasive, invasive carp phone number and email address, a single point of contact for people to be able to reach our staff so that we can get up any questions, any reports of invasive carp and get them to the right place and, and get out and respond to them. So I, could, I guess at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions for Brian, thank you so much for that presentation. You can raise your hand. Um, and click the raise hand button down at the bottom to ask it yourself, or you can pop it into the chat and LCCMR staff will take a look at it. Looks like we already have a question from Nancy Gibson. Nancy, go ahead. Um, thank you. And thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Always love to hear, Brian, what, where this money is going. Um, I have a couple questions. One about pheromones. Recently, we did uh, some research on pheromones. Was that anything that you thought about using to capture and attract the carp? It's a good question. Um, we have not used those to date. I know there's research out there being done to try to look at different attractants. And we've actually been looking at, and in our current proposal, using some attractants. Um, USGS has been experimenting with different food attractants too, as a way to concentrate fish. And so that's in our current um, plan is to try experimenting with some of those attractants because um, they're they're pretty well established and easy to do. I think that the pheromones um, are probably still you know something that's maybe a little bit more in development, but I think it's definitely something we should look at and uh, try to make sure that if it's something that people feel like is ready to be tested, we should be out there trying to use them too. Thank you. May I have a follow up? Yeah. No? Okay. Please. I'm curious about your male female tagging your ratio. And was that intentional? Um, so we've um, mostly been opportunistic in our tagging. Um, so the, the big head that we have on the St. Croix, um, you know, is, it is a male. And we've been following that one around for a while. Um, the five that we tagged down in, um, in the Pool 8 area, those, those were ones that we just kind of had the opportunity to tag. Um, I think that we want to tag a mix um, because those those different um, sexes might be using different habitats at certain times of the year. And so we don't want to just tag males, you know, thinking maybe we would, if removing the females, maybe you're trying to remove eggs, but we still need to learn about it. And I think it's important to remember with those tag fish that they're, they're probably a very small number relative to what's out there. And so us having, you know, an extra four or five fish out there probably is not what's going to determine whether those fish become established and start reproducing. Um, but what we learn from them is much more effective in us than being able to remove more fish down the road. So I feel like it's it's very worthwhile for to have us to have those tag fish out there. Thank you. I'll I'll ask some other questions offline. I don't want to. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Um, all right. Well, I'll go with one of my questions. I want to know. So obviously, locks and dams are a limiting factor <laughs> in carp in Minnesota. But are there other limiting factors at work that are slowing the invasion of carp? 
Yeah, that's that's a really good question, Rory. We're we're trying to look at our native fish populations because we think that they probably play a role in that too. Um, and so that's why one of the reasons we're trying to do some monitoring of them at the same time. Um, so there's a much more robust um, predator population in our Minnesota waters than maybe downstream in some of the waters like Illinois has. Um, and so those predators, um, things like gar and bowfin and, and species like that might actually be really important in preying on any potential reproduction that might happen in these waters. And then there's also a lot of species that are competitors too. So there's, there's uh, planktivores like buffalo and paddlefish that feed on some of the same things that these invasive carp have. And it's, it's interesting to think about what the role of these different competitors as well as predators might have in reducing the, the likelihood or even you know, potentially just the severity of, of you know, invasion down the road. Great, thank you. This is also interesting and I feel like we'll be hearing a lot more <laughs> about this project and your work um, in, in years to come. So thank you very much. Um, we're gonna move on now to our next presenter, Dr. Mike Schuster from the University of Minnesota. And we'll be learning about the project Cover It Up Using Plants to Control Buckthorn, which was funded through the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center from Minnesota Laws 2014. Thanks for being here, Mike. Great, everything look all right? Looks great. Awesome, uh, perfect. Uh, so yeah, thanks, happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Schuster. I work at the University of Minnesota um, with Peter Reg and Peter Reich in the Department of Forest Resources. And we lead this project called Cover It Up. And so I'm excited to share some of our findings from that project on how we might be able to use native plants to suppress uh, invasive buckthorn in our forests. Uh, this work has been a pretty collaborative effort, though, uh, from people all around the state, including property owners, land managers, uh, various practitioners, and over 100 citizen scientists from our ongoing citizen science pro program. So as you may know, buckthorn is a widely distributed invasive plant throughout Minnesota, and removing it is a common priority for land managers. Unfortunately, those removal efforts are often effective only in the short term. Uh, this is because removing buckthorn uh, and removing the majority of the understory in a lot of these forests causes us to massively increase light availability and the availability of soil resources at the forest floor. And so, for example, in this photo here, you can see um, an area where we've left buckthorn intact and another area where uh, Buckthorn has been removed. This is uh, not coincidentally a, a property line, right? This happens all the time. You can only remove buckthorn up to a certain point. Um, and so it provides a really clear illustration of the, the before and after here, right? If on the left, we have really low light availability and on the right, we have really high light availability because there's no more buckthorn there. Um, and this could be a good thing for plants trying to reestablish on the site but um, after years of buckthorn invasion, there's generally not very many native plants left to do that. And instead, we just have a, a really well-established seed bank of buckthorn that can rise up and take advantage of those extra resources that we've now made available to them. And so this means that buckthorn very quickly reestablishes in many cases and forests require continued repeated management um, over time. And so buckthorn removal becomes more of a regular maintenance activity with significant environmental impacts and economic costs for land managers. So this is a site where uh, buckthorn was removed and then this picture is taken two years later and you can see that it's mostly mostly buckthorn and uh, you know it's, it's just as tall as, as we are. So, so that's what happens if, if we just kind of follow the, the normal process. But what happens if we can establish native plants to prevent forests from slipping back into this buckthorn dominated state? Uh, that process is called revegetation and is something that's uh, very commonly done in grasslands and also done in forests, but for different reasons. Uh, a lot of times it's done for either improving biodiversity or providing habitat for wildlife, 
uh, providing fuels to do controlled burns um, or for cultural or recreational aesthetic reasons, things like that. Um, but of course, by planting native species, we're also increasing competition for light. Uh, in this photo, you can see that uh, in a place where we've seeded in grasses, there's a lot more cover and therefore a lot less light reaching the soil surface compared to the area on the right here where there's been no seeding and therefore there's much less cover and much more light reaching the soil. The question is, is this enough to suppress buckthorn and prevent uh, the forest from moving back into this buckthorn dominated state? And so we tested this in two experiments evaluating how well revegetation can help forests resist ongoing invasion. Both of these experiments are somewhat dependent on good initial control of buckthorn after removal. So we're typically operating within the context of large plants being killed, uh, for example, through herbicide use, um, and therefore unable to produce a large amount of re-sprouts. Um, so we're largely focusing on resisting invasion um, over, over the long term uh, from seeds in the seed bank and also those that are dispersed by birds, which present a continuous threat of invasion uh, to the forest going forward. And so in this first experiment, uh, we use small, very densely planted uh, plots to test a broad range of approaches, ranging from uh, just not doing anything, uh, an unplanted control, to seeding in a diverse mix of grasses and wildflowers to planting in uh, little plugs of, of Pennsylvania sedge, um, to using bare root plantings of sugar maple and balsam fir, to using um, kind of a shrub cocktail of uh, different shrub species. So red elderberry or common elderberry, as well as American hazel and gray dogwood. And so those were all planted um, in 2017. And over the next few years, we monitored them to see how well they established and how well uh, buckthorn grew underneath them. And we found that all of these revegetation options, whether we're seeding or planting sedges, planting trees or planting shrubs, uh, reduced the establishment of buckthorn from seed. And you can see that in this graph here where uh, on the vertical axis, I'm presenting the cumulative buckthorn growth or uh, the total amount of buckthorn that uh, grew in these plots relative to the number of buckthorn that were there at the beginning of the experiment, uh, relative to all the different treatments here. And what we found was that uh, shrubs had the strongest effect. By planting shrubs, we reduced buckthorn invasion by about 89%, um, which is pretty significant. That's a pretty large effect size. Um, trees had a, a similar effect um, of reducing invasion by 81%. Um, and our data suggests that these impacts are likely due to each of these plantings creating dense leaf cover that persisted well into fall and even into winter, um, whether that's due to um, the, the evergreen uh, balsam fir or the very long lived uh, leaves of uh, the elderberry species. And so that elderberry species uh, is largely what's driving that, that shrub effect. And you can see what that planting looks like here. This is one of our, one of our brighter sites where the plants really took off. Um, after just a couple of years, they were just completely um, dominated by these elderberry plantings. But we also saw significant impacts of our, our more conservative strategies. Uh, so planting seed, planting seed reduced buckthorn invasion by 51%, and then planting sedges reduced it by 66%. In our second experiment, we tested the effect of seeding in general uh, at a larger scale. Uh, we did this with, a, with an experiment at seven different sites around the Twin Cities that ranged in light availability. Uh, you can see our Elk River site here. Uh, which was our brightest site with about 19% light availability or 19% canopy openness, uh, and our hasting site over here, which was um, our darkest site with about 4% light availability. And then the five other sites were in between those, those two values. And so we seeded these sites with uh, 11 different grasses, including wild rice, uh, 22 different wildflowers like snake root and uh, black-eyed Susan, and then two other sedges. 
Again, that was started in 2017. We found that seeding was most effective at suppressing buckthorn at brighter sites. So here again is, I'm gonna show you another graph. Uh, this is surviving seedlings um, over canopy openness. So how bright the site is. Um, and the gray line here is the unseeded or the control effect. And the green line here is what happens when those buckthorn are growing amongst the seeded species that we put in. And you can see that um, there's a really strong negative effect of seeding uh, as canopy openness increases. So in a site where uh, the canopy is really open, uh, like you can see in this picture here, that's about 20% canopy openness. We had a 70% reduction in buckthorn relative to that unplanted control. In slightly darker sites, so looking at something that's about 7% canopy openness, as you can see in this photo here, we had a reduced effect, only a 33% reduction in buckthorn invasion. And so we've shown that revegetation can slow the growth of existing buckthorn and prevent new buckthorn from establishing, uh, reducing the need for repeated buckthorn management. But the question is, or the method, that is most, most effective uh, varies by site. So again, I'll show you two similar graphs. Uh, this is again, surviving seedlings uh, relative to canopy openness. Um, in our first experiment, we showed uh, that shrubs and trees, these two lines down here at the bottom of the graph, uh, reduced buckthorn survival relative to the control planting um, across the board. So bright sites, dark sites, it, they worked basically effectively um, across the board after, after three years. Uh, in our second experiment, again, we tested seeding. Uh, we showed that seeding was most effective only in those brighter sites. So here we have the, the unplanted effect in gray and the seeding effect in green. And again, you'll see that, that the difference between those two lines is greatest in those brightest sites. And so our results illustrate how herbaceous seeding can lead to healthier forest with less invasion, uh, particularly in sites with 10% canopy openness or greater. Uh, and we also show that shrub and tree plantings, particularly with species that hold their leaves late into fall or winter, can prevent buckthorn uh, establishing more broadly. Particularly, this is probably gonna be useful in darker sites where seeding is ineffective. And so planting those trees and shrubs are really gonna be our only viable option for establishing plant cover. So thank you. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can always contact me uh, at my, my U of M email address here, or you can check out our website, coveredup.umn.edu. Uh, that's our, our uh, citizen science project website. And so it has lots of stuff um, about our general research, but also about that project. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so, this is our time for questions from anybody. Um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand on the with the button down below or drop a question into the chat. Um, Mike, I just want to lead off with a question. I was wondering, what does this management strategy, you know, you talked a lot about the kind of site level. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think this could be implemented on a regional or state level? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So um, there's a, a few different things that that we could uh, take away from this. One of them is that um, sites that um, sites that are inherently uh, rich in some of these um, some of these trees and shrubs uh, are probably going to better resist invasion in the first place. So, if we're looking at uh, forests that have a lot of elderberry in them, uh, perhaps we we might see less buckthorn invasion into those sites over time. Uh, it also suggests that at a re broad regional scale, perhaps we want to be promoting some of these species, particularly uh, elderberry species, as a means of building uh, resistance against invasion more broadly. Uh, so even if we're in an area where buckthorn isn't a problem or as big of a problem right now, we might want to be proactive in establishing some of these species in order to build that resistance and prevent, uh, prevent invasion in the first place. Because that's that's much easier to uh, to deal with uh, a few plants compared to uh, 
a, you know, a dug in invasion already. Great, thanks. Uh, looks like we've got a question from Nancy, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Schuster, two questions. Did soil types come into play uh, with some of these species? And my second question is, can you get this data out to some of these restoration uh, sites? I live in the Twin Cities and the City of Lakes are trying to do a lot of this restoration. And I've been a little bit involved, but I, I can see they're not using some of your data. Yeah, yeah. Um, so soil types, um, we, we've uh, looked at the different soil types. We haven't seen a huge impact of, of soil in, um, in determining the success of our, of our plantings. Um, I think perhaps where soil type might be more influential is uh, predisposing a site to being invaded in the first place. All these experiments were done in places where buckthorn was very abundant. And so um, were, were all sites that had soils that were amenable to buckthorn. Um, but there are some soil characteristics, particularly if we're looking at the acidity or sandiness of soil that may make some sites less hospitable um, or less easily invaded. And so maybe they aren't included in our, um, in our current set of, of sites because of that. Um, we are addressing that in some ways uh, with our citizen science program. Uh, our citizen science program, like, as I said at the beginning, has over 100 different uh, volunteers and therefore over 100 different sites where we are running very similar, smaller scale, widely dispersed versions of these experiments in order to understand which sites um, or which conditions best favor this as a management approach and uh, in which sites or conditions it's most effective. So that's an ongoing question that we're eager to evaluate. Um, as far as getting the information out to out to folks, um, we're we're trying. <laughs> uh, we do we do partner with a, a good number of different organizations, and we try to keep them up to date on everything that we're finding. Um, and and so we we are always happy to to take advantage of uh, platforms to to share our data and, and to share our findings. Um, it's just a matter of of having those platforms being made available. I think so. Thank you. Brian, go ahead with your question. Yeah, as long as uh, we've got a chance. I, I'm interested, um, I noticed that some of the uh, species, you know, you planted didn't maybe do as well in that sort of more shady habitat. And so that's maybe why the buckthorn was able to do better. Um, do you think if you'd use different species that were more shade tolerant, you might see a better effect with, with those sort of habitats? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, you know, this is a very limited set of species. Um, you know, we tried we um, we tried to develop our our plantings that, that you see here uh, with kind of a, um, uh, a casting a wide net, um, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> um, in order to to represent a, a diversity of different approaches. Um, that seeding treatment uh, that you see in this experiment is the same seeding treatment that we used in the, the second experiment. Um, and that consists of 33 different species, many of which are, are very shade tolerant, um, but we still, saw, we still saw our seeding treatments uh, be most, um, most effective in those brighter conditions where uh, grass establishment happened quickly. Um, one of the things about the more shade tolerant species, particularly the wildflowers, is that they may require longer to germinate and establish in the soil. And when we're playing a, a game of, um, you know, who gets the most light fastest, uh, taking time to establish is not necessarily an, an advantageous trait. Um, so, you know, making a, a composite of, of different, uh, uh, different resource acquisition strategies uh, is probably a, a good idea in this context. Um, but yeah, uh, more shade tolerant species are something that, that you, we would expect to do better in darker places. And I think we do see that too um, with the shrubs, which are generally more shade tolerant. Um, certainly the trees, sugar maple is extremely shade tolerant. And we saw both our shrubs and our trees do very well in those darkest sites even. So I think that points to perhaps um, a woody approach being more advantageous in those darker sites compared to an uh, compared to an herbaceous approach. Mm 
Great. Thank you so much for being here, Mike. We really appreciate it. I, I love when the solution to fighting off an invasive is plant more natives. <laughs> it's great. So uh, our final presenter today is Dr. Daniel Larkin, Associate Professor and Extension Specialist from the University of Minnesota. And we'll be learning about his project, Impacts of Invader Removal on Native Vegetation Recovery, which was funded through the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center in Minnesota Laws 2017. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, thanks for having me. Everybody can see the presentation okay? Great. Yeah, I've really been enjoying the presentations and discussion, and I think you'll see some similar themes in my talk as Mike's just sort of uh, moved under from the forest underwater. So when I think about aquatic plant communities in our lakes, for me, the goal is to have this um, condition of vegetation that's uninvaded and diverse, which has intrinsic biodiversity value. Uh, for the plants themselves, which I care about a lot, but also provides a lot of other benefits to people and nature. One of the threats to these high quality aquatic plant communities are invasive plants. And what we worry about, one of the things we worry about with aquatic invasive plants is that they can displace native species. And so we have this arrow with a negative relationship and past work supported by LCCMR and MACERC has investigated um, these effects. Our main management tool in lakes for invasive plants is herbicide. And so what we obviously hope to have happen is that we'll use herbicides and they'll reduce invader abundance. And that's also something we've explored with thanks to past support. And then we have this sort of often make this assumption that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, that there are these indirect, indirect benefits of herbicide treatment to native plants through this kind of double negative pathway. But of course, it's also possible, and both of these things can happen simultaneously, is that there are direct non-target impacts on native plants. So there's sort of collateral damage to native plants. And then there are other factors like the ability of the uh, native plant communities to come back on their own, uh, very relevant to Mike's discussion. Um, and on land in restoration, we really rely often on active approaches to revegetation, planting and seeding. We don't really do that in our lake vegetation. Um, but one thing that's likely important is just how much capacity is there within a lake, how much residual seed bank and other um, propagules that aquatic plants use to reproduce, how much diversity is there in the lake for that recovery of vegetation. And then environmental conditions are so important and in particular light availability, of course is important for all plants, um, but in an aquatic system, the light availability really decays rapidly with water depth. And that's especially true when we have um, reductions in water clarity because of excess nutrients and other factors. And th that light availability is the major mechanism as well for how invasive plants negatively affect native plants. So there are, there are additional uh, paths here that I, that I haven't even drawn. So, we have sort of a simple goal of supporting diverse native vegetation in lakes, but it actually becomes a pretty complex set of relationships when you start unpacking it. And we are in the midst um, in this project, um, although our funding has completed, of we have a lot of analyses in progress looking at these relationships and kind of figuring out the, the strength and direction of these relationships visualized here with this stunning animation. So um, our project really involves uh, complementary approaches to investigate these relationships. And we're relying on two main strategies. We're conducting in-lake experiments and we're synthesizing treatment outcomes 
And the work I'll be talking about today has been led by Wes Glisson, who's a research fellow in my lab, and then especially Mike Verhoeven, who's a doctoral candidate. Um, and what I'll be talking about today forms the basis of his dissertation, which he'll be defending um, in 2022, which is exciting. So our in-lake experiments are controlled replicated experiments. And the importance of doing these is they're really the gold standard for determining causality and really pinning down these mechanisms. And so what Mike has done through really a, a Herculean effort is to implement these different treatments underwater. So he set up large plots that are untreated control plots where, you know, it just has left the invaders and the native species as is. He's performed invader removals where they scuba dive and hand pull. And so you can get complete um, removal of the invader. He's added propagules of native species, so seeds and turions and other uh, reproductive structures. And then he's also implemented both invader removal and propagule addition. And he's applied these four treatments in five different lakes that span a water clarity gradient. So we can get at this roll of light. And then he's set up multiple replicates within each of these lakes and he's established those at varying water depths so that we can again get at the role of light. Altogether he has 112 of these plots and he has collected four years of data. So it's really a nice um, set of work that he's done in terms of its scale and duration. And some preliminary results, the, the invaders in question here are curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian water milfoil. And we've you know, shown um, how they are altering these native plant communities. We've also found that when the invaders are removed, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, they really rapidly recolonize. But there are benefits from that invader removal, this kind of fleeting window. Um, that greatly alters community structure in ways that are beneficial for native vegetation. And light availability is really a key driver of the native community. And that's determined by both environmental conditions, so kind of lake water quality and other factors, and the presence of the invaders themselves. It grows so densely um, that it's like the buckthorn scenario where the light just isn't getting down to the lake bottom. So paired with this is the our synthesis of treatment outcomes. And here we're examining what are the real world outcomes of invasive plant management. So sort of the, where the rubber meets the road and what is the status quo of all the um, treatments we're doing across the state and have been for many years. It's very difficult to work with aquatic plants and to study them. That's why you know a plant ecologist spends so much time in grasslands because they're a lot easier to sample. But there is a silver lining to this, which is that the difficulty in sampling them has led to a standard protocol called the point intercept method being nearly unanimously adopted for a couple decades now, which is quite different than the situation in terrestrial habitats. And so there, we recognize that there was a lot of data out there that would be informative, but somebody needed to acquire, aggregate, and analyze it. And that's where Mike has come in. So, Here's what we've got so far, and there's, there's more potential for growth. We have 18 years of data from over 1,500 lakes in Minnesota, comprising over 3,000 surveys. And in these surveys, people go out on a boat and they sample different points with uh, metal rakes. Um, and so there's over 350,000 of these points in this data set. And at each point, they'll find um, varying numbers of plant species. So we have over 550,000 observations of native and invasive species. So it's really a very rich um, plant diversity data set that then by looking at management records and bringing in some environmental information, some environmental data, we can explore those relationships that I set up at the beginning of my talk. And there's also um, 
funding from from LCCMR and MACERC has really uh, allowed us to access data that has a lot of financial value underlying it. A, a point intercept survey, if you were to contract this out from a private consultant, is typically about three thousand dollars. So this data set that we've compiled represents over $10 million worth of data and a great opportunity to better understand native invader relationships and lake ecology and to evaluate the effectiveness of our management. So um, we've been sort of mining this data and will be for, I think a long time to come. Um, and here are some of the findings we've gotten from it so far. Um, this paper looked at results of curly leaf pondweed management, and we found that sustained herbicide treatments did push down curly leaf pondweed abundance, but there were sort of diminishing returns. And there were bigger factors beyond the control of managers that uh, limit management effectiveness, particularly water clarity and overwintering conditions that affect curly leaf pondweed. We contrasted the potential negative impacts of Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed by looking at the niches they occupy compared to our native species and propose that Eurasian water milfoil is more likely than curly leaf pondweed to have these direct competitive effects where they're displacing native species. And then beyond this particular project, um, the the data set that has resulted has contributed to additional research like um, other MACERC subprojects like this one on how climate change affects Eurasian water milfoil invasion and how Eurasian water milfoil invasion affects property values of lake homes. And then with funding from the Minnesota DNR, we studied the seasonality of sorry stonewort invasion, another aquatic invader. And by having this, this rich data on Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and a lot of native species, we're able to um, show that starry stonewort is really doing something distinct in our lakes. And then uh, importantly, from a education, outreach, and citizen science perspective, these findings feed into our AIS extension programs um, here at the University of Minnesota, um, the joint effort of extension and MACERC. And in particular, um, these results are used in our AIS detectors program, which is a, a citizen science program and AIS management 101, which is a online curriculum to train lake association members and others in kind of understanding the science and practice of invasive species management. So I wanna acknowledge the funding from um, ENRTF and LCCMR and MACERC, and then also additional sources of support that were used in this research. And here's my email address if anybody would like to get in touch about any of this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dan. This is fantastic. So if anybody has any questions for Dan, you can raise your hand or you can always drop a question into the chat. Um, I can lead us off with a question. So you used data from over 1500 lakes. <laughs> it's a lot of lakes in Minnesota. Were there any ones that were like notable surprises or exceptions to you in your work? Mm, that's a good question. I would say I probably don't have a fine enough grained uh, you know, Mike is the one who's really handling the data and he could probably better answer that question. Um, but I think what's really exciting for me from a research perspective is just the, the broad spectrum of lakes that we have both geographically across the state. And then also the, um, you know, we have from small shallow lakes to deep big lakes. We have huge variation in water clarity um, in the, extent of invasion um, in the intensity of management efforts. So um, that really allows us to kind of try to tease apart these different factors that are affecting the, the invaders and the native plants. Mm -hmm. well, great, thanks. Um, Nancy, you got a question? <laughs> 
Thank you again. Um, is there any hope? I mean, it feels overwhelming and we keep trying a little here and a little there, but it just keeps growing. And uh, I feel like it's the buck, buckthorn of, the, uh, of our beautiful clear water. Any ideas, any thoughts, any hope? Yeah, no, I, I understand where you're coming from and um, I can relate to that sentiment. I think there are, I do feel hope um, because there are things that we can do. Um, so for one thing, early detection really is a powerful tool. And I think sometimes we have this conception that once a lake is invaded, it is invaded and it has you know, fundamentally changed. Um, and it's really, it really varies the, the um, you know, how much of a lake, a given invasive species will sort of become dominant in. And so I kind of try to, in our extension programs, kind of push back against this idea. We, we want to be concerned about the spread of invasive species, but we also don't want to feel, um, recognize invasive species as a, as a threat and a stressor, but um, there's a lot of variation in the outcome. So lakes are not ruined by invasive species being present, they're altered. Um, and so especially if we can find things early, um, our management can be much more effective. There are also, you know, so much work is happening in the state to try to improve water quality. Um, and that has great value for aquatic plant communities, which isn't necessarily, you know, what's really motivating um, that work, but our um, native aquatic plants are so dependent on, by and large, on good water clarity. And so when we have these programs that are, um, you know, working to reduce runoff of nutrients into aquatic systems, um, that can really yield a lot of benefits. And then um, we have many uninvaded lakes. Um, and so the, the threat at AIS is very real, it's growing, but um, not all of our lakes are impacted. And then lastly, I think what we need, and I'm very biased here, but is more of a restoration oriented approach to lake vegetation. We've tended to really just focus on the invaders and sort of getting rid of them. But I think we, we can learn from prairies, wetlands, and forests how much can be done to um, support revegetation and kind of active approaches to lake restoration. And that's something where we really barely scratch the surface. So I do see hope. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Um, it's about that time. We're at the end of the show here today, folks. Um, thank you so much for joining us at this LCCMR lunchtime lecture. Um, in two weeks, we're going to have our final LCCMR lunchtime lecture, and this one will be all about pollinators. Um, it'll be on Tuesday, February, 5th, February 15th from 12 to 1 p.m. And uh, we'll have a Google form to register for the event, just like we had for this one. And it'll be shared on the ENRTF Twitter and Facebook accounts soon and sent out in our next updates from the LCCMR email. So thank you again so much, everyone, to our presenters and our, our participants for joining us today. And we hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody.